Stanford University. Well, I mean, the guys asked me to uh, discuss a little bit uh, soft x-rays and, and what they do in relation to uh, soft matter or condensed matter. And you can rephrase it in a way, why would you want to spend 90 minutes of your life uh, thinking about soft x-rays or why do some people uh, want to spend a large fraction of their life uh, and think about uh, soft x-rays and what they can do. And if you think about it, uh, it is really because soft x-rays have uh, uniquely powerful capabilities. Um, you can phrase them in, in basically three uh, big boxes. For one, they are element specific, which means if you have like a arrangement of atoms, which is like different elements, you can pick out one or the other. Uh, or if you have a very dilute system, you can pick out the active center from a whole bunch of crap which is sitting around, which is necess necessary to drive it, but actually, which you know, you don't want to specifically look at all of it, but only at a few atoms there. Um, it also has a great capability towards magnetic information, which is related to that because magnetic properties are often linked to electrons at very specific atoms, which are F or D elements. And all these things uh, are, are really fun, uh, and that's why soft x-rays have been a very strong tool and continue to be a very strong tool. Then, of course, with the new sources, a lot of interesting aspects towards ultra-fast timescales come in. And in, in my take, this has really two aspects. For one, you can, of course, take the extrinsic time skill and do a pump probe type of experiment and simply say, you know, let, let's excite the thing and then see how it uh, evolves with time. But as we will see also, soft x-rays actually induce very fast intrinsic time skills in matter. And you can utilize these intrinsic time skills also to learn a lot about the dynamics. Uh, of metal. And finally, that is a thing which comes up in the last years. It seems like soft x-rays and matter have actual, actually relevant cross-sections for interaction in the nonlinear regime. And that is, of course, a thing which also makes soft x-rays in the future even highly relevant because it seems like the soft x-ray interaction nonlinearly with matter is much, much bigger than the interaction with hard x-rays and matter. And to start it off, I mean, does anybody know why soft x-rays are called soft x-rays? I mean, why are hard x-rays called hard x-rays? I guess, well, this is in German and, and, and that maybe helps you a lot. But if you think about the spectral range, and the sizes, I mean, the wavelength, which we're talking about of soft x-rays is in the nanometer to angstrom range. And that's basically where molecular systems sit in size. And the energy and size, in a way, relates through the wave function. And therefore, you can probe molecular and atomic properties with soft x-rays. They are, in a way, called soft because they can, in principle, be stopped by matter. And they can be deflected on mirrors. And hard x-rays are actually in their energy higher, so they cannot be stopped by matter so well, and you cannot deflect them with mirrors. So a soft x-ray, you can bend in their direction and stop, whereas a hard x-ray, it's much more difficult to get it off its path, which is just flying straight ahead. Uh, and that's where really this type of uh, wording comes from, which doesn't have a very deep meaning. It just reflects on the propagation uh, differences which soft and hard x-rays do have. Now, let's go through it, and I have to find the right way to switch forward. Um, when we think about uh, element-specific and chemical state-selective properties, why do they exist? And if you think about that a little bit, it's two aspects which are always negotiated. For one, chemical information comes apart because Atoms share electrons, right? If you have a bunch of atoms sitting around, there are electrons which are linking them together. They're hopping from one center to the other, or they are delocalized. The benzene molecule, the classical example, there are electrons which are all over these six carbon atoms, and they're shared. And that's which makes them bond together, but that's also which makes a lot of the chemical magnetic correlated properties. 
And this valence density of states spanning over multiple atoms is really what it creates bonding, creates material properties, and what creates dynamics. So per se, we could say soft X-rays are actually useless because they can also go to inner shells, and inner shell electrons are localized on one atom. So they are super boring because they are just stuck on one atom. So what do you want to learn about chemistry if, you know, if the the electron you're looking at is only sitting on one specific side and doesn't interact with a lot of neighbors. So the trick is that soft X-rays can actually just have the right energy to create a dipole transition between these delocalized electrons, which make the chemistry and the properties, and the atomically localized um, 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 core electrons, which are sitting at one specific side. And that's just a dipole transition which does that. And it's therefore a atom-specific projection uh, of the uh, chemically relevant valence electrons onto a core electron. And as you can learn here too, core in German means Rumpf, uh, which is basically a beautiful uh, word, Rumpf, right? Core level, inner shell. Does anybody have a, a laser pointer that works a little better? Um, so this, this is, this is uh, the core of how we project it out. So if you now think about a more complex material, for example, you take a molecule on a surface, you can take an amino acid here in that case, which has here two oxygen atoms and they bond to the metal atoms. You have here a nitrogen atom, which also bonds to the metal. And in between you have two different carbon atoms. One is the so-called methylic and the one is the carboxylic because in that group, thank you. That's cool. Um, you can actually now um, really try to play this game and project the total valence in this whole system on these specific atomic centers. And that's basically what has been done a long time ago already um, to play this game and really do the projection of the occupied density of states by decaying from the valence states into a core hole and watch what comes out on the oxygen atom, on this carbon atom, on the other carbon atom, and the nitrogen. And not only do this and integrate in direction, but look in different orientations. And since these are dipole transitions, there is angular anisotropies. And therefore, you can actually even see in which direction these p orbitals uh, in the valence stick when they decay into the 1s core shells of these various elements. And the same you can do for the unoccupied density of states, which is uh, X-ray absorption, where you just lift the core electron up into the unoccupied P density of states in a dipole transition. And that's fun, because even though it's a really complicated system and there are very few molecules on a huge metal crystal, I mean, the crystal is huge, and there's only one tiny molecular sheet of amino acids on it, you can pick out exactly what is the valence electronic structure, and zero is the binding, uh, is, the, is the Fermi level, and you really learn how the thing bonds. The question back then was, is it bonding unidentate or bidentate, which is the question, is it actually bonding here on one oxygen only or with two oxygens? Uh, but that's a technicality. And I think with that example, you see why X-rays, soft X-rays are fun, because you have these elements selective, Capability, you can get information on electronic structure in a very dilute and a rather complex system. There's one thing which so far I would say is not so obvious how, how this works, which is these are two different carbon atoms. In principle, why can you separate them? The carbon 1s electrons in both carbon atoms are basically the same. They are just deep down in the potential. They don't even see in what they are. And that uh, brings us to this issue, how we access actually these inner shells versus outer shells, and the topic of binding energy and chemical shift. If you think about what we have basically looked at a little bit, we have here the density of states of matter, which is the occupation number of uh, electronic states as a function of energy. And we're defining the binding energy as something related in, in that sense either to the vacuum level or to the Fermi energy. And we have therefore the valence states which share with neighbors and the core states which actually sit at specific atoms. 
And soft X-rays, because they have sufficient energy, allow to lift all these electrons into vacuum and create basically free-flying electrons which have kinetic energies, classical photoemission. And so you link the binding energy through the photon energy to the kinetic energy of the particle. So an electron from the valence will be very fast because the optical energy creates this uh, energy difference. It overcomes the work function, which one could talk another hour about what the work function is. But in the end, it is a free particle. And the electrons which have been deep down and strongly bound around the nucleus, they have to overcome a lot of this energy, the binding energy, and are freed with lesser kinetic energy. And that's all very nice. And um, we can therefore measure the valence states by simply looking at this energy distribution of the free particles. But we can also, of course, measure the core levels um, and distinguish them because each core electron and each element has very different binding energies. For carbon, it's 280 electron volts. For oxygen, it's 530. For a lot of transition metals, it's 700, 600. So these levels are uniquely different. The valence levels, they are all about the same between 0 and 10. But the core levels, they differ about hundreds of electron volts. So you can separate them extremely well. And soft X-rays lift them out, and that's why we can separate them. And that's why we can also project them and really get this great information. Now, let's come back to the point, why are these two carbon atoms separable? Because that is not an obvious thing. Because in principle, it's only carbon <coughs> somehow stuck down to the core. And for that reason, we have to come to the issue of the chemical shift. The chemical shift has been a mysterious uh, issue in the 70s. And because people were starting to look at the binding energies of larger molecules, and they figured out if you take, for example, this plastic, which is actually Viton, it's a, it's a Viton seal, right, the plastic material, and you figure out that there is a bunch of different carbon atoms and this one has three hydrogen atoms around, and this has three fluorine atoms, and this has oxygen atoms, and this has, of course, this type of environment. So at first sight, you would say the carbon one as core level, independent where it sits in the molecule, should be with the same binding energy, because it's just the carbon nucleus and the first electron flying around, and it doesn't see a thing about its environment. And so people were very puzzled to see that there is actually these very, very different carbon 1s binding energies. They thought it should be a single line, but it turned out that each of these has a different line. Um, in hindsight, or if you, if you take it lightly, um, you would say, well, maybe that's actually not so hard to understand. In principle, what I do, I pull out an electron here on this carbon atom. And I have here a bunch of neighbors, the fluorine, which attracts electrons like crazy. It has to do with electronegativity. If I have an element around which wants to soak up the electrons, it becomes harder to remove one into the vacuum because there's this competition from the neighboring atoms, which also wants to grab this electron. And that explains, in a way, why when I have hydrogen atoms around, which don't really want to gobble up this freed up electron, it's easier to remove the electron from here, which is reflected in a lower binding energy of about 288 electron volts, than there, where the fluorine really wants to pull and keep the electron, which leads to a much higher binding energy. And so people have been looking at this in great detail and make tables about it, um, and linked, in a way, electronegativity to binding energy shifts. Um, and that's what this thinking led to this idea of the chemical shift in core level electron spectroscopy, where not the energy of the core level changes, but the neighbors make it easier and harder of the electron to get out, and you have to overcome this barrier. Now, that's of course one way we can look at it, and maybe we would understand it on this um, glycine molecule. But to be honest, the glycine molecule is hard to say. Everything sits on the metal. So 
this copper metal gives electrons basically for free. So it's not so obvious why one carbon or the other carbon wants to give up the electron more or less easily. And this links, hold on, this links to this debate. Where is the binding energy coming from in these uh, kind of systems where electronegativity difference cannot make a big difference? If there is no difference in net electronegativity, what drives it? And one example which has been debated over many years by various groups, that's the example from Niels Mortensen and Anders Nielsen and Dietrich Menzel, and these people had different examples. But they said, if we can understand the binding energy difference for nitrogen, dinitrogen, two nitrogen atoms sitting on a metal surface, right? If we can understand how they differ, that, that, that is a big step ahead. Because if you measure them here, you find that there are two peaks. There is one peak and another peak, and this is shake up, so we don't care too much about it. But there is a very big shift in nitrogen binding energy, nitrogen core level binding energy, depending if you ionize the inner or the outer nitrogen. And nobody knew what is what. And there was actually a long debate, which line belongs to which atom? Because in terms of electronegativity, there is really not a great argument. It's just sitting on metal. And you know uh, what makes this huge difference? So, that's the way, the thing we got to uh, kind of understand how to deal with it. And if you now think about it, how you can conceptually work on it, uh, if you're like an experimentalist or come from this direction, uh, the simplest way to look at it is to take a total energy picture, which means if I want to get the binding energy of a electron that I remove from the system, the safest statement I can make is, that the total energy which the system had in the beginning minus the total energy the complete system has in the end must be the binding energy difference. Because I rip out the electron. In one case, I have n electrons. And the otherwise, I have n minus 1 electrons. The removal of the electron, and everything has equilibrated and is peace and happy, this energy difference of removing the electron must be the binding energy. Um, and that's a thing which we will dwell on quite, quite a bit. In this picture, people talk about initial and final states, where the initial state is just the thing unperturbed, and the final state is the object or matter with the core electron removed. But it's really the macroscopic object, right? There's a competing view on it, which, is, uh, one should, uh, uh, which I will not dwell on a lot, but I think uh, we should keep an eye on it which is the, the, the view when you think of binding energy in the perspective of orbitals. Per se, there's not an obvious link, because the orbital is, 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 is a certain way to look at a, a, a multibody problem. Now, the idea here is that if I can get an orbital state, I could simply assign the orbital energy to the binding energy. Uh, and, and for example, if I have a Hartree-Fock thing, I have to change the sign in order to get uh, the, the, the energy scales right. But I principle just say the orbitals which comes out of calculation has something to do with the binding energy uh, in a one-to-one -one relationship. And this is, of course, good and bad, because in our process, we take out the electron. So obviously, once we take it out, there's going to be relaxation, and the whole thing will kind of you know, rearrange. And so these things are, so to say, one has to add on in addition. And in this picture, when people talk about initial and final state effects, it's a very different way to look at it. Because here now you say the initial state energy is the unperturbed, unperturbed orbital energy, whereas the relaxation in these things is the things which I call final states effect, once I ripped it out. And that's a different thing to hear, where I really say this is the total energy of the complete system. Now let's stay with this picture, because I think that's something which uh, when, uh, with a few approximations can work with. What does it mean for this nitrogen business? Um, we can say in the total energy picture, if you want to calculate the binding energy of the 
Night of the, if, we, if we ionize the inner nitrogen, we of course have to take the difference between the total energy of the system minus the total energy with the electron taken away from the inner nitrogen, right? And if you want to take and find the binding energy of the system at the outer nitrogen atom, I have to take the total energy of the system and subtract the total energy when the electron has been removed at the outer nitrogen, right? What's nice about this is, of course, in this picture, the total energy in the ground state is always the same. It's nitrogen on metal, right? So here and there is the same energy. If you draw this energy scale, this is nitrogen on metal, OK? What is for certain, if I now rip out a electron, let's start with the inner electron. Also we, we, we rip out the core electron here. That costs energy. So it's for sure that ripping out the electron from the core level at nitrogen will cost me energy on the scale. The interesting question is only, how do I actually get this energy as a quantity? Right? Where can I get it from? How do I get an estimate of the total energy of the system once I rip out the nitrogen 1s uh, electron from the inner atom? And this is a way of looking at it, which is the so-called equivalent core approximation. Let's think about this a little bit. I wrote it down, but I say it in words. If I have an atom, which is a nucleus, around the nucleus flies, let's say, the inner shell electron. This is a tightly bound state. And then have all the valence electrons further up. For the valence electrons, the core level electron is screening the potential of the nucleus, right? The nucleus is a positive charge, and if I have an electron flying around it, it screens partly this charge. So the outer electrons see a, a screened core charge, right? But that also means if I take out this core electron and, for example, lift it into the unoccupied density of states, the, 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 the atom stays neutral, but all of a sudden, all these valence electrons see actually more of a positive core charge, right? Because this inner electron is not screening anymore. And that means if I take the element carbon, for example, and I lift the carbon 1s electron up into the unoccupied density of states, all these electrons all of a sudden seemingly see the potential of a nitrogen core and you have an equivalent valence electronic structure of nitrogen, which is basically the same like core excited carbon. Okay? And that means that if you core excite carbon, core level here is Cl, core excited carbon behaves like nitrogen to a good approximation. Core excited nitrogen like oxygen, core excited oxygen like fluorine, and so it's always the valence of a core excited system behaves like the Z plus one element in the periodic table. The same game you can, of course, do for ionization. Here it's not a neutral species. Here you have the core ionized atom behaves actually like the valence ionized Z plus one element. Okay? And that's, of course, fun because with this analogy, you can learn something about how we construct the energy of the core ionized or core excited species. And this is quite simple. If we rip out the electron here, or core excite, in the Z plus one approximation, this inner nitrogen ionized is actually very similar to oxygen, right? And that means if we do the same process but on the outer nitrogen atom, it becomes very similar than having the uh, oxygen-like atom there. Okay. So we can now think and wonder which energy is lower. Is it more, does it cost me more energy to remove the electron here or the electron there? Which is the question inner versus outer. <laughs> 
And this we have to think through. From a chemical statement, we can always say that these type of molecules like to absorb the nitrogen down, the oxygen out, the more electronegative species sticks further out. And therefore, this is the species which is chemically uh, allowed, whereas this is the species which actually doesn't exist. right? So energetically, it's more favorable to have this type of adsorption than this type of geometry. Okay? Which so means, can I ask yes? A question about this? You said the more electronegative species sticks out. What does it mean? I mean, the metal surface is rich in electrons. So if you have the electronegative species hanging there, you have a lot of electron-electron repulsion. Is that the energetic term? Well, I guess you could look at it like that. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a statement which you wouldn't want to make if you only had that specific molecule. But if you look through the series of CO adsorption, NO adsorption, uh, all different elements, they have this type of orientation. You could either argue that uh, because there is a lone pair state, which is preferential to have, so to say, oriented in this way or not. So I would take it as an, as an example. And on the next slide, I will lead to the general feature, which is related to this. But for that specific example, this is why this is energetically preferential to that. And that, of course, gives us the situation that in the total energy picture, we know that to core ionized, the outer nitrogen has a lower energy than the inner nitrogen. This energy difference is the energy it takes to basically rotate this NO molecule from one to the other direction. Now, that explains it, of course, directly. And it tells you that the core level binding energy of the outer nitrogen atom is less than the core level binding energy of ionizing the inner nitrogen atom, which means this is the outer nitrogen atom ionized. That's the inner. And that has been counterintuitive to what people thought a long time, because they thought, actually, the inner nitrogen has a lower binding energy because it's closer to the metal. So it is, has easier access to mobile charge versus the outer. And it's just the opposite. Right? Now, this is just a model to explain this type of thinking. And if you, of course, you can make an energy difference. And this is the shift, also the relative change. If you do this in a more general picture, that's the idea to derive core level binding energies in their shifts uh, in a stepwise process of thermodynamic properties. And if you, it's the so-called born hartmann cycle of this core level binding energies. Very powerful for experimentalists. If you take, for example, a metal, call it nickel, whatever, also a metal. Um, Z is the element of the metal, right? Also, we call it nickel. If we want to find out what is the core level binding energy of having one of these atoms in their core ionized, clearly no argument with electronegativity will ever work because it's, as I said, a metal. Right? And going through as we did, we can now decompose all these things in these steps. First of all, we can say this metal is, of course, composed of individual atoms. And the energy you gain by joining these atoms together to a metal is the so-called cohesive energy, which is a tabulated chemical value. These individual metal atoms, you can core ionize, and you create the core ionized atom. This is also a thing you can precisely determine and measure. This core ionized atom, of course, is to good approximation equivalent to the valence ionized Z plus 1 element, which is, if you have core ionized nickel, valence ionized copper atoms. This you can also, of course, determine fantastically uh, in, 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 in spectroscopy. And therefore, you know then what's the, the ionization, the valence ionization energy of these type of Z plus 1, in that sense, copper atoms. Now, of course, these copper atoms, again, you can create into a piece of copper metal, which is the cohesive energy of copper. And then finally, you actually can make an alloy out of copper and nickel, which is the Z and Z plus 1 element, which is the alloying energy, which is, of course, uh, 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 concentration dependent. And at the lower limit of impurity, this is having a single copper atom in nickel metal. And by that, 
you can basically walk around this scheme and have all this thermodynamic and precise measurable uh, gas phase quantities and determine the energy difference of having pure nickel or the pure set element versus a single copper atom or a set plus one impurity in. And this energy difference is exactly the core level binding energy in such a system, which really is otherwise a little tricky to get at uh, in, a, in a purely orbital based picture or like a picture of electronegativity. Now, the situation is even trickier because all metals in these systems in bulk are not continuous. They have surfaces. And what you learn is that on the surface, the core level binding energies are again different to the bulk, which is good and bad. In a metal, this is disturbing because you would say a metal is a metal is a metal. The screening and all these things got to be the same. I mean, there cannot be a huge difference on the surface versus the bulk. But uh, this is what Niels um, uh, has measured a, a long time and uh, even spent part on his PhD on this problem already. Um, but it's a very interesting issue. If you take two metals and put them on top of each other and you do a few layers, in that sense, terbium on molybdenum, for example, you find different core level binding energies for these different layers. One is associated to the so-called surface layer. The other one is associated to the bulk layers. And the third is associated to the interfacial layers. So each of these interbium core levels have different binding energies, and they are highly sensitive to where they are stuck in this sandwich. And this is basically measured up here as a function of layer thickness. In a monolayer, of course, only interface exists. Uh, if you grow two layer, you have interface and surface. And if you go thick, you have surface, bulk, and interface. That's basically shown there. Why is that? And if you look at that in a little more uh, systematic way, what you notice is if you go across the periodic table, basically, this is a 5D element where you fill the 5D shell from empty to full. And if you compare the surface core level shift, the energy difference between the bulk core level shift and the surface core level shift, it varies systematically. If the D shell is kind of empty, the surface state is shifted to higher binding energies. If it's half filled, it's the same as the bulk. And if it's really full, it shifts to lower binding energies. So also here, people have been said, what the hell is that? Um, and it's very interesting, because one can learn a lot about how electrons and, and these things uh, play together. Now, a deep thing to understand it is linked to what d electrons do. d electrons are basically covalently interacting electrons. And that means if you have a covalently interacting electrons on two atoms, if I bring these atoms closer together, I get a bigger splitting of anti-bonding versus bonding states, right? So the classical game. They are far apart, small splitting. They are strongly pressed together, large overlap, large splitting. This is if I have two atoms. The same happens if I change the number of neighbors. If I have, in a bulk, a metal atom which has neighbors on all sides, it has much more orbital overlap with equivalent atoms than if it's sitting on the surface where it only has neighbors on one side, on the other side is vacuum. So it's very clear that as the so-called coordination increases, overlap increases, which means for these covalently interacting bands or states that the band uh, width of the D band increases. That has been shown by putting uh, single gold atoms on nickel and making them more and more and more. At a very low concentration, each gold atom is alone. And then the film kind of gets thicker and thicker, so the, the gold atoms start to get neighbors. And then they got, uh, become like bulk. And if you do that, you see that the width of the 5D band, which is a measure of overlap between equivalent atoms, increases towards the bulk value, which just exactly this thing is. So that is actually what makes the electrons for atoms on the surface and the bulk so very different. It has to do a lot with coordination, if we forget about geometric reconstruction and a lot of other things. 
But that's a, a, a strong driver of difference. And if we now actually think what it means for the density of states, I either have to draw on the blackboard uh, or I, I live with that. No, I draw on the blackboard because nobody understands that, uh, including uh, uh, a bunch of people. So if we have here the binding energy, right, and here's the occupation number, what's of course cool, if I'm in bulk, I have a certain band structure, which is the width of the D band, which has to do um, um, with the uh, overlap with the neighbors. On the surface, I have less neighbors, and that means that on the surface, the width of the D band is narrower. Let's call this bulk, and the narrower one is, of course, 5D band width surface. All right. What's also clear is um, that the element is the same. So the number of states is the same. So as I make this band narrower, the uh, number of states has to become higher because, of course, the total area stays the same. It's always the same element. And this is now drawn here. And what, of course, interesting is if I fill this now with electrons to a certain level, let's say I can fill maximum 10 electrons, but I only have here like one electron which I fill. In the bulk, this electron will just occupy this density of states. In the surface, there is no density of states there, and that means that the electrons, this electron has to go energetically here and fill this area, okay? It still has to be there. It still needs an electron in, the, in, this, in this D shell, but energetically got to be somewhere else. Now, this would, of course, work if it f floats around freely, but of course, this is a metal, so these two levels have to be pinned. This is the Fermi level, right? So it shifts everything here on the same energy scale. That's exactly what's drawn here. Basically, you see the bulk density of states, and you fill it with a small fraction of charge. Call it one electron or two electrons. The surface density of states has the same area, but it's narrower, and it fills with the same number of electrons here. And that creates an offset. Now, this offset is, of course, not sustained because the Fermi level is always one energy, so it pulls that back. And that seemingly shifts the bulk level lower, uh, the surface level, sorry, the dash level lower compared to the bulk. Is that understandable, kind of? So that, that creates the surface core level shift when the band is filled to a less degree. Of course, if I fill five electrons, which is half shell, I would fill all the way to here. That's an interesting situation, because if I do the half filled shell, I'm just here in bulk and surface. So obviously, there is no change in this shift. This is exactly what you see. If you have a half-filled shell with five electrons, the surface and bulk core level shift cancels to zero. Whereas when I'm empty, I have a shift in one direction. This is understandable from here. If I do exactly now the situation of a very full band, I fill all the way up to there in the bulk, but on the surface I fill to there, and therefore it reverses the direction of the shift. So this is this explanation how the surface bands really uh, create, um, how coordination for the same element in a com perfect conductor creates a difference in core level binding energy, uh, which is an important thing to create selectivity uh, in these type of uh, systems. So um, I want to better understand. You essentially, you said that all the low-lying levels in atom are defined in the solid state with respect to the Fermi level, right? Not with respect to the vacuum level. I think so in a molecular language, would you agree that would mean it's defined with respect to the homo lumo gap, not with respect to the IP? That is an issue which you're totally right with what you say. Um, of course, you can define the binding energy towards the Fermi level in all conducting systems very well. But, and maybe I, I switch back, even though switching back is always evil. Um, <laughs> all right. So if we, if we do that, basically 
what Marco said, that, that I have referenced the binding energy to the Fermi level, which is a good idea in, in these type of systems. In a molecule, that's not such a great idea, because the homo lumo uh, situation always puts the question, where's the Fermi level? Is it just in between, and so on and so forth? Even in the semiconductor, it's tricky. And that's why a lot of people want to benchmark the, the core level binding energy to the vacuum level. In the total energy picture, you actually benchmark to the vacuum level, if you so want, right? Because you get the energy difference to the removal of the electron. And then there's a, a very close link uh, to what the vacuum level and the Fermi level really means in a metallic system. And actually, it's a very simple thing. Because if you think about it, if you have a piece, what, you know, what is the vacuum level anyway? You know that, but I mean, let's see. Who can explain to me what's the ionization potential in the vacuum level? Nina knows that too, I'm sure. But I mean, there are other people around who know that maybe. Maybe it's not a trivial thing. Also, if you think about an atom, we agree that this atom has bound states, right? This is a core level, this is a potential. And there are bound states. And sooner or later, there's a convergence limit, right? Which is the ionization potential. I mean, the ionization potential separates the last bound state from the first free state. Because obviously, ionized means free electron. A bound electron means not free. And that means that for all these systems, if you have a nitrogen, uh, if you have a, a very simple atom, the energy is, of course, uh, some constant divided by the quantum number of these states, right? One number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the convergence limit of this n to infinity, if I go n to infinity, this is zero. That is the last bound state, um, where obviously n counts the number of nodes in the wave function. In a molecule, that's also true. In a molecule, you have a multi-center approach. You have a bunch of atoms. That's a pretty nice molecule, I would say, for a start. And um, now, the deeper bound uh, electrons are localized on specific electrons. But as the energy gets lesser and lesser, you start to end up in orbitals which are spatially extend. And as they get even further out and further out, they actually become so-called Rydberg-like. They start to become similar to a classical single center cooler potential. And that's why also that system has, for very high quantum numbers, for n towards infinity, it also goes to, to the zero, which again for, uh, creates this ionization potential. Now, if I take a metal or a solid, I always get this strange work function. And people say, what the hell is this work function? It's, in principle, something very easy to understand. Because if you have a metal or an object, you can remove, there are a lot of atoms in there. You can remove an electron. What this work function says, I can bring an electron over the Fermi level, and the electron still cannot leave. Right? This electron cannot leave the metal, even though it's not in a state you know, in the bulk. It's somewhere in between. It's not in the metal anymore, but it cannot leave. What does it mean? It means if I have a metal here, I can bring this electron by a transition, and it travels somehow out here. It's a negative charge. And of course, it will create a mirror charge, because it sits in front of a metal piece, if you so want. So it will induce a positive mirror charge, which really binds this electron to its own created potential. The scaling law of this type of mirror charges is also quantized. And it's actually also a constant 1 over n squared. So trapping an electron in front of a surface or a metal has has so-called surface states, which are also, also scaling to a quantum number, 1 over n squared. 
And therefore, this has also a limit again if you go to very large numbers. This goes again to zero. And then this is the so-called vacuum level. So in principle, it's a very strong analogy between a large molecule. On a large molecule, you would say far out, the bound electrons become Rydberg light. If you take a piece of metal, you could also say, in principle, you could create an electron which is somehow hovering around this piece of metal and is trapping itself in a quasi-coulomb state, coulomb potential. And it's also this type of Rydberg-like behavior with this convergence limit, but we call them surface states. And we have developed a totally different language because we call it work function and these different things. But it's nothing else than the, um, than the, um, um, the potential which is trapping the state. And that's why your question, do we uh, have to look at it very differently in the solid and in the gas phase? Because in the gas phase, people like to reference to the vacuum level, which is this level, whereas in the solid state community, we, trap, uh, we reference to the Fermi level, is uh, partly a matter of choice because these things strongly link and relate. And we, we are not, uh, we, we, we are more for historical reasons in these different languages, but we, could, we can unify this uh, through this uh, way of thinking. All right, I, I spool forward again a little bit. So we went through binding energies. And why we did it is because it explains that we can pick up these somewhat slightly different arrangements and get great selectivity. We heard already a little bit in the last talk that there's also magnetic selectivity, which I don't want to go in detail because I've got to save some time, I guess, at some point. Uh, it really has, is nothing else than the fact that you, you can, uh, if you have a spin split density of states uh, and you have a, a, a core level which has angular momentum, uh, you can, in principle, take the, the L and S state and couple. And if you do a three-half state, L and S add up positively. And the other one, the S is the opposite. And that's if you so want a source of polarized electrons which you can create at a certain atom. In reality, it's of course that the transition elements uh, between the core level states and the valence states, and if you want to go through it, uh, it's quite tedious. It is the coupling of angular momentum uh, between different uh, states, the so-called klebsch gordon coefficients, which link these different things. If you take the three, I mean, uh, uh, core level, which is a p state, three half, you can add up L equal one plus spin like this, or you have L minus one and spin like this, and then the other mixtures for the different J's. And then you can go into D states, uh, which have, of course, then a five half, seven half, and so on. And you can also construct them. And the dipole transitions basically give a imbalance if you have a uh, delta ML plus minus one, which means you have left or right circular polarized light. And this imbalance means that the transitions from the core level to the valence level with circular polarized light leads to a, for right circular now in that sense, stronger occupation of spin up state versus spin down state. That's basically the trick how you get, so to say, magnetic selectivity. Uh, and it's, again, a projection of an atomically localized core level on a very distributed density of states where you use atomic where you use atomic uh, uh, elements to create a very defined uh, analysis of uh, the spin polarization in the transitions. And by that you can learn, because you know the spin polarization here 100%, and therefore if you don't know so well what exactly is going on in D shell, you can learn that. Because you have here a very well-defined state, the, the, the D state, uh, or the, the three-half state, and so on and so forth. Now, in a nutshell, what I was trying to convey is that even though we are, of course, interested in chemistry-wise or whatever materials-wise in the valence states, um, we don't are obliged to probe them in a direct way by just taking out the electrons and see what they do. This is a thing we do all the time, valence band photoemission and these things. But we can go through a core state, which is localized, and then have these things here decay and basically learn something about them in these atom-specific projections. So the core state is a pathway through a localized state into valence excited states, which then teach us about electronic properties, orbital properties, spin properties of the valence states, 
as seen through these core resonances. And I, I'll dwell a little more on this issue because this is interesting because we think about this as, as steps which are somehow separate and this works pretty well for most of us, but really this is a scattering process because the creation of a core hole and the destruction of a core hole is closely linked. One and the other cannot be separated, right? If you create a core hole, it will go away. And if you detect the decay of a core hole, it must be created earlier. So core hole creation and core hole annihilation is always a process which is linked. It's a so-called scattering process, yeah, or a, a coherent process which links these two steps. And that's exactly the thing which uh, is another part why cohort spectroscopy is so powerful because really it's a scattering process. We take a photon, which is a soft X-ray photon, we bang it onto metal, which could be atoms, molecules, solids, the hell what. And in this process, we lose energy to the metal. We create excitations in the metal, right? And for one, we transfer momentum because the direction in which the photon comes in is not the direction in which the photon comes out again. Which means, obviously, there's like a billiard action. You transfer momentum in this thing, right? There's the recoils, if you so want. And the other one, you transfer energy because a photon which can come in can create excitation uh, within this material and therefore lose energy. It can potentially also gain energy. That's what people usually call like a Raman process. It's a scattering process where you start from the ground state, you absorb the photon and you emit it again. And everything which gets stuck in there is the energy loss. And this energy loss can be electronic excitation. Then we learn something about electronic excitations, obviously. But it can be vibrational excitation. It can be spin excitations. It can be the reorientation of orbital polarization. All these things are excitations. And all these things we can do at a selected atomic site because they are so sensitive in the core level binding energy because they are all shifted for this very environment. That's a lot of fun. And so the simplest thing you can do there is simply absorb the photon and emit it again in a way without changing the energy at all. You start in the ground state, you have your potential bound electrons. The X-ray lifts up one electron from the core level into a valence level. And then this electron says, well, nice up here, but I got to go back. And it just falls back to the same ground state. So from ground state, core excited ground state, there is no change in energy of the in and outgoing photon, a so-called participator process, because the electron which goes up participates in the decay back down. That, you could say, is really boring, because obviously the initial and final state are the same. But it's actually very instructive to learn about something, what happens in between. Because if you do this on a simple molecule, this is the ground state of oxygen, and there's a wave packet. The X-ray lifts this wave packet up into a core excited state. Then there is some time associated, which is the so-called core hole lifetime. We'll learn a little more about that. In that time, all these states which have been mixed because we didn't excite, excite a single one, but a, a multitude of states, they changed their uh, composition. This relaxation leads to a changed wave packet, which then decays back down, and it falls in this potential energy surface. And since these are Frank-Condon transitions, you all of a sudden see a hell of a vibrational progression. right? That's exactly what this experiment does. So even though in our scattering process, the photon comes in and comes out with exactly the same energy, there is a hell of a lot of action. because we have only looked at electronic excitation, but of course there can be vibrational excitation, there can be spin excitation, there can be orbital excitation, right? We don't always have to create an electronic excitation. And it also tells us one thing, that the scattering duration time is actually on the time scale where these atomic motions and 
electronic motions happen. So it's very interesting. Scattering a soft X-ray photon on matter takes time. It takes a few femtoseconds. And these few femtoseconds see how matter changes during the scattering. That's the so-called intrinsic time scale, I would say. Now what you also see is that if I change the photon energy of the scattering photon, I make it a little lower, all these beautiful vibrations go away as if nothing has happened at all, right? And that is the thing we can also nicely understand. And I skip over that. Um, so why do they go away when you go to lower energy? Going to lower energy really means you start from the same ground state, but the photon energy you provide doesn't just quite make it to the excited state, right? There's energy missing, the so-called detuning. We, we, we don't get to the resonance. Now, a simple-minded person would say, well, aha, uh -huh, interesting. So seemingly, I'm missing energy, but I can do that as long as the scattering process is shorter. Think about Heisenberg. Heisenberg says, or the Fourier limit says, I can borrow energy versus time. I can create a, an excited state if it's only there for a short time. I, for example, I can create out of vacuum a particle and an antiparticle if they recombine again very rapidly and annihilate. So I can borrow energy versus time in this simple picture. And you could say, if I go below the resonance, you would say the scattering gets faster. You have a seemingly faster scattering process. And people have fused that in this concept of so-called effective scattering duration time, where they say the time of the so-called natural lifetime, which is the lifetime the scattering takes when I'm exactly on resonance, gets seemingly shorter when I detune off the resonance. Let's look at that a little more better. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Which energy would actually be the V0,0 transition? Uh, that is this to that, yeah, and, and so then back. Uh, at which energy in, in your left hand figure? Uh, that, that is, is uh, this, this is a loss scale. Yeah. On a true photon scale, this is this scale. This is 530 electron volts. Okay. But it's, it's, it's renormalized to the loss scale to get rid of the total energy scale of excitation. So if you think about what it means, it's actually an um, uh, interesting uh, exercise. What happens? You start from the ground state, you absorb the photon into an intermediate state, and because we have all these vibrations, there are a bunch of them, the sum of all of these, and then all these states sooner or later get decay into the final state through another dipole transition. And this is a resonance term. So once we hit the resonance energy between ground and excited state, that becomes zero and becomes a very strong driven state. And then we have here, of course, the, the lifetime, which is this complex number, which has to do with the Gauss, uh, Laurentian width of this uh, issue. And we'll learn a little later wh where this actually comes from. So we can simply rethink this a little bit and say, basically, what we say the photon energy is basically the total energy plus the detuning energy. And this, all right, let's, let's do this on this graph because this is easier to understand. So we say this is our nominal resonance and the photon energy we send in is of course, this energy plus, photon energy plus detuning is the energy at what we're getting, which is EI, also the excitation energy. And the lowest energy we could reach is J. So if you rewrite this in, this in these different scales, basically you have of course, the photon energy set as a starting energy. We have the detuning energy of the nominal resonance. And we have, of course, the true energy into which we excite. So to cut a long story short, what happens is if the detuning energy becomes large, this is the dominating factor in all these different terms, right? So I can throw out all these various terms. And what happens is basically that independent through which intermediate state I go, I always have the same type of cross-section. And that is kind of interesting because then basically these two intermediate states or the sum over all intermediate states basically fall, fall out and become a completeness, completeness relation. This is, I think, maybe a little tricky to, 
uh, go through it on, on a slide, to be honest. Um, but nevertheless, it's interesting, and it basically tells you that um, when I go in the strong detuned region, I basically end up with a quasi-direct transition. Let's look at it in a different way, the scattering duration time thing. Maybe it's easier to understand. What you could also do, you could say, I take these relative energies of the lowest resonance and the, true, and the excited resonance energy. And then, of course, I could say the so-called uh, scattering duration time is actually not only the complex time, but I also have this detuning energy. And I sum these two energies together and create a new detuning energy as the sum of this, where one is, of course, complex and the other one is real. Right? I have a real part and an imaginary part. And the imaginary part is obviously, um, is this gamma or gamma? It's gamma. And then I have here omega. And basically, if the detuning is zero, I have only the imaginary part. If the detuning becomes sizable, this vector moves over. And this is then basically omega. And this is, of course, uh, the square root of uh, gamma plus omega squared squared. So I have a, a new vector. And if I convert this h bar divided by this length, this is the new effective scattering duration time. A little messy argument. But if you, if you, if you cut a long story short, uh, basically this is the same what is known from optical Raman spectroscopy. If you take iodine or whatever, um, what people have found out very early on is that if you have a molecular absorption line through which you do a Raman scattering, uh, and if I tune my laser off this life, this, this resonance, uh, the apparent scattering time in this Raman process uh, is significantly shortened. And the same thing happens, of course, with x-rays, but on a femtosecond time scale, whereas with optical lasers, I mean, 70s, uh, this happens, of course, on very long-lived states, nanoseconds, right? But that's fun, and, and it gives you a feel that we can also play with this intrinsic scattering duration time, trying to utilize it in order to learn something. Now, this is a very robust feature. We see these vibrations and these excitations everywhere, uh, in gases, in liquids, in solids. And of course, we can also probe the electronic excitation, which is a big thing, where we don't go back into the ground state, but we end up into electronically excited states, or spin excited states, or orbital excited states. And that's a whole industry, because out of this you learn basically what is the excitation spectrum of matter? And that has to do with what is the electronic structure, what is the spin structure, the orbital structure, and so on, so on, so on. And if you do this in O2, I cut this a little short, um, you see basically not only the ground state vibrational excitations on the ground state potential, but you see, of course, all the electron hole pair excitations which live on electronically excited potential surfaces in the system. And you can link this information again, basically, to valence electronic structure in these materials. Now, O2 is nice. The bulk of that is with inelastic extra scattering goes, of course, to solids. Because think about it, it's a very similar problem. You have superconductors, which is composed of copper oxygen planes plus doping and so on and so on. And you want to know what are the orbitals, what are the spin state, what are all these properties on the specific sites, right? And that, of course, inelastic scattering can do beautifully, and it can determine the dispersion. The dispersion is clear how it works. The photon comes in onto the sample. It comes off the sample. And resultant, there's a momentum transfer. And this momentum transfer, in principle, kicks the thing in different directions, if you so want. And if you then rotate the crystal in a two-dimensional or one-dimensional system, you can really understand how it links to the dispersion of the excitation in this material. What excitations can you probe? Of course, you can probe phonons, which is the same like the vibrations which we have discussed in the oxygen case. Because, I mean, it doesn't get simpler than two oxygen atoms. If you have a big crystal which has all kinds of phonons and dispersion, I mean, clearly, that's what you probe, and it's much more trickier. It creates spin excitations. That's also, in a way, not obvious, but also, to some degree, clear. For example, if you have an anti-ferromagnet, uh, 
Each atom has a spin and each neighbor changes orientation. If I create a core excitation at a state which has angular momentum, let's call it a, transi a transition metal 2p electron, which has L equal 1, this angular momentum can couple to the spin and flip it with a certain probability. And that means that in the X-ray scattering process, I can reach a final state where in the beginning it was a perfect antiferromagnet, but in the end one of the spins is flipped. So all of a sudden in this antiferromagnet there is some place where it's the wrong orientation. It's always up, down, up, down, up, down, and then it's up, 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 down, up, down, up, down, up, down, right? So all of a sudden you have three spins which are parallel because the one in the middle has been flipped. And this excitation will lead that they hop to the neighbor and create basically a pair of up, down, up, down. So it makes always up, up in this up, down, up, down. And basically this, this excitation will travel through this crystal and create as a spin excitation. And this is a so-called spinon or a magnon. And if you have two of them, because one travels the one and the other the other, it's a bimagnon. And so these spin excitations are basically excitations which are not electronic excitations, but just spin reorientation excitations, which are created in the core excited state, because the core excited state can have angular momentum which couples to the original spin state and flips it. And so that is used to a large degree to understand that. And then, of course, we can do electronic excitations. We can lift a electron from one orbital to another. That's what we typically use to study about chemical bonding. Philip Wernert will talk a lot about what, in Rick's speak, is really electronic excitations, excitation between d orbitals or p orbitals. And in addition, of course, that can not only happen on one atom, but it can involve a neighbor then it's a charge transfer excitation. Then you start on a very localized D or F state and you end up in a delocalized S or P orbital. So you basically couple a localized original state to a very delocalized state. And that's what people call a charge transfer excitation. And all these excitations, of course, this scattering process can pick up in one measurement on specific atomic sites. That's a very powerful tool. I just show some things where this has been shown, and I think these are landmark papers. In this paper, it has been shown that really, in an antiferromagnet, what is detected when you measure as a function of angle the spin excitations in a Riggs experiment, um, that you basically really map out the so-called bimagnon dispersion, basically two spin excitations which travel in opposite directions which has been disputed if this measurement in Riggs is the same measurement than in inelastic neutron scattering. Neutron scattering also measures uh, bimagnon excitations, but it measures it at a different point because neutrons are heavy. The recoil they give is very high, and that's why you're always far out in the momentum space, always at pi pi. Whereas photons are light, they transfer very little momentum, so they measure around the gamma point, basically very little momentum transfer. And that's why it has been difficult to match that together. This experiment has shown that this is really the same thing and that you can probe this here, element specific. You can say where they start, which neutrons never can. They cannot say where the thing started. Um, another experiment which is also very interesting um, has been by Justina Schlapper and, 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 and uh, really a lot of uh, theory people and so on and so forth. Swiss Light Source, also a lot of Dresden people. And they have shown if in the excitation, if you do a Rick scattering process on this specific atom here, this is an antiferromagnet, the spin is always up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And then you have always a certain orbital orientation within this material. Of course, if I do a Rick experiment, I can have this electron decay and excite into an other oriented orbital, right? So all of a sudden, the electrons, which used to be all in this in-plane T2G state, all of a sudden at the scattering site, the electron is in this spatially rotated orbital, right? That's an interesting situation. So what happens with this excitation? And what has shown there is that actually, here you see beautiful what happens. Basically, 
the spin excitation, I mean, it, it changes place with this side. If this hops to there, you have all of a sudden this orbital there and the spin there. So they are in the wrong direction. So they are all of a sudden ferromagnetically ordered. This is a spin on uh, in one direction. In the other direction, you have the same problem, but in addition, you have also the orbital in the wrong direction, which is so-called orbital excitation or orbiton. And so they could show that the spin and orbital excitations can be excited and separated and so on and so forth. And that has been very interesting because neutron scattering also cannot excite orbitals because you need a, a vector, the dipole excitation, to create direction in this excitation. And that is the dipole transition or the dipole term. And therefore, this, the excitation of spin and orbital excitations and their separation in energy and momentum space are crucial steps ahead with high resolution in elastic X-ray scan. All right, we went through that. Um, and I think uh, we got a good understanding why this is fun and we can probe element-specific uh, excitations in electronic structure and magnetic and so on and so, so what not. And I got to get a feel of the time. Um, ten, more minutes. ten more minutes. So I got to really shorten to, to, the, to, the, to the point. All right. So there are two ways uh, we can look at that. Of course, we can do dynamics. And we can do dynamics using two ways. We can either say the scattering processes are fast. They take only a few femtoseconds. Or we can say the scattering process is fast, and that's why we use them to probe dynamics. right? So either we say there we can probe dynamics, which is much slower than a few femtoseconds, or we can say we can compare to dynamics on the same time scale. And that's exactly the thing. If you do pump probe, that's what a lot of people at LCLS popularize. You excite matter, and you look how it evolves. That you can do with a lot of phase transitions and different systems. This is a, a, a system which we have studied at Flash a long time ago. And basically, what you learn there is that if you melt a tetrahedral solid, there's an odd thing happening. If you melt ice, if you melt silicon, gallium arsenide, you name it, everything tetrahedrally bond, such a geometry. If you melt it, the liquid compacts. The liquid is denser than the solid. It's an abnormality, an anomality, so to say, right? A liquid should be dense, should be less liquid than the solid. If you make something cold, it should become dense, right? If you melt something, it should become less dense. Tetrahedral solids don't do it, they do the opposite. And that is actually quite fun because it means that there are two different types of liquids. You can transiently create a so-called low-density liquid before it equilibrates into a so-called high-density liquid. That's the same for ice, silicon, gallium arsenide, everything which has a tetrahedral bonding geometry in the crystalline phase. And what we have done there is we used inelastic X-ray scattering and basically probed as a function of pump probe delay how crystalline silicon converts into a low density liquid phase and then finally into a high density liquid phase, which is really just liquid silicon. Um, the trick is that you see basically how the band gap closes. Crystalline silicon is a semiconductor. A low density liquid silicon is a semi-metal. And a high density liquid, which is just liquid silicon if you boil it in a pan, is a metal. So RIGS can probe that because the excitation spectrum is very different if you have one or the other. So that's fun. And the goal there is, of course, to push this much, much, much harder to the limit of transform limited pulses in energy and time. If you look at soft x-rays, that's very interesting. Because if you take the carbon edge and you get a resolution where you can see phonons and magnetic excitations and all these things beautifully, you still are at the Fourier limit on such a domain that you actually have 100 or 400 femtosecond temporal resolution and see all these excitations. If you go to the copper edge for, let's say, for a cuprate or something, you can do a 100 femtosecond temporal revolution, uh, te uh, resolution and still see all the phonons and magnetic excitations and how they evolve. That would be fun to create driven states and try to induce something like superconductivity by changing order parameters and these things. That's the dream.
And therefore, in Hamburg, the Excel uh, user consortium is pushing very, very hard to get this infrastructure going. And I'm optimistic uh, that we can achieve that having such a large spectrometer and such a device. Now, we said in these experiments, we say this process is fast compared to the dynamics. So we can take it as a snapshot. The other way to look at it is we say, oh, this dynamics we use to understand how the system has changed during scattering. And that is, of course, a thing which is also very interesting because people would like to understand very basic things. Basically, how, for example, a photon, an electron, and a, how angular momentum is transferred, for example, magnetization studies. How fast does an electron flip its state when it hits another electron or a phonon, right? That it comes from up to down. And there are a lot of processes in directions. And so questions have been put up how we can study this. And if we think about it, we can probe it in the following way. We take a material where the X-ray excitation lifts a P core electron into an S density of states. And then it can only decay from an S density of states into a P density of states. But if a phonon comes along, which kind of gives that thing a kick, then all of a sudden a P electron plus a phonon that transfers angular momentum still allows to decay into a P electronic core state, right? So having an occupied P electron decay into a P core state is in a dipole transition not allowed. But if you have a phonon which takes angular momentum, it's again possible. So when I do this game, and you do this in the case here in silicon as a function of temperature, what you really see is the hotter the material gets, the more of these P2P decays happen because there are phonons around which take up the angular momentum. And doing this experiment, you can benchmark this and extract scattering rates, which is quite interesting because you learn two things. For an electron and a phonon to scatter, the rate to transfer linear momentum this happens every five femtoseconds. If the electrons and phonons basically fly around, very, very often this process happens that a linear momentum is transferred. Whereas that an electron and a phonon transfer angular momentum is much rarer, right? In comparison, it takes a few hundred of femtoseconds that this process will happen uh, there. Or you, actually it's a rate, but you can convert it, of course, in time. So it's quite interesting because you learn from the intrinsic time scale during the 10 femtoseconds of the scattering process with a certain probability these processes happen, linear momentum transfer or angular momentum transfer. And therefore you benchmark the intrinsic core lifetime to the material dynamics. That is called the so-called core hole clock approach because you take the lifetime of scattering as a femtosecond clock to compare an other process, right? You have X-ray scattering and you compare it to an other scattering process which could be electron phonon scattering, momentum transfer, angular momentum transfer. That has been done in this kind of experiments. Now to wrap it up and come to the last point, why will the soft X-ray story go on? I think it will go on as it is because it has great capabilities to probe materials, but it also, in the new time of new sources, has great capabilities which only soft X-rays can do. And it has again to do with the time of scattering. It's a few femtoseconds or sub femtoseconds. And that means that on a synchrotron, the situation which we're having is that at a certain scattering resonance, which is in a range of EV, and during the scattering duration time, which is a femtosecond or maximum 10 femtoseconds, we have only a single photon in the sample. So really, if you think about it, on the synchrotron, most of the time the sample is sitting there and there's only at one specific atom something happening during a scattering process. So it's really blip, 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 blip. They are totally unrelated. At the FELs, because the bunches got so much shorter and the number of photons are a little higher, you all of a sudden have actually more photons during scattering duration time and at the right energy within the sample. So all of a sudden, it's not blip, 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 but 
they all can work together. And this is, of course, the reason why now you can start to think about nonlinear processes. And the cool thing about it is, what we talked about and what we discussed as natural lifetime has a very, very interesting link to the stimulated processes. Because this is the way how we looked at it, the Raman process. But of course, you can look at it differently. You could say, of course, we excite the state, but then we have a stimulating field which drives it back down. We actively stimulate it down, right? And we simply make a, a, a replica of the stimulating field, and that comes back out. Now, that is what is called stimulated Raman scattering. So what's the link between the two of them? And this is an important point, because what we got accustomed to is that this is the so-called natural lifetime where it just mysteriously comes back down after a few femtoseconds. But why does it actually do that? Why doesn't it just stay up there forever, right? Um, the reason is the following, that really matter is never just sitting alone. There is not, not such a thing that a single atom just hanging free in the universe. There's always background radiation. If you take, for example, the, the idea of black body radiation, you can say the field by the black body radiation is, of course, a thermal component plus one half. So there is the so-called zero energy. The zero energy is a similar thing then. You can all the time create matter, antimatter, and annihilate. Create, annihilate, create, annihilate. So, there is radiation field around us all the time at all frequencies. For one, driven by thermal contributions, but always by the so-called zero-point energy. And that's also present for X-rays. It's always there. So if you think what the zero field is, you just punch in the X-ray energy, and that's the zero-point field which is hanging around and is impinging on each excited state all the time and stimulates it, of course, back down. So what we call spontaneous emission is nothing else than the down stimulation from the zero point energy field which is around us all the time. And that's why we call it natural, because of course it never goes away. And that is really the rate who does that. That's of course interesting, because we can easily estimate how much field do we actually need to actively drive it. If we can create an X-ray field which is so strong as is the background radiation, we can start to play with it. And this is the thing we can look at. Basically, you take this formula and just take an X-ray energy and calculate that. And out of this, you get, of course, the, the intensity, also what per square centimeter, number of photos, or whatever you want to call it. And there are two interesting points. For one, the classical fluorescence yield, the natural decay in fluorescence yield, of course, when this field, the stimulating field, becomes equal to that, it starts to become sizable, right? Then, of course, there's another field in an atom, which is actually the core. There's a positive charge in the core. That's also creating a field. And it's actually 100 times stronger than this optical field. It's much, much stronger. That's why the fluorescence yield is only a percent from the Coulomb decay. The Coulomb decay is so strong because the Coulomb field is very, very strong and it wants to pull down this electron. The zero background field is much weaker in comparison. That's why it's a minority channel. And that means if I go higher in fluence, I also start to compete with the Coulomb channel. The Coulomb channel, all of a sudden the molecule doesn't want, or the atom doesn't want to decay as a Coulomb decay in Auger, but it wants to be stimulated down if the field strength gets so high. That's fun. And, and, and this is accomplishable at X-rays, uh, FELs, uh, pretty easily. It also explains us where the natural lifetime comes from. The natural lifetime is the stimulation by the background radiation all the time. So it's not natural. It's, well, it is natural, so to say. Um, time is over, he says. What is important about it to know is that you can replace these two things and get rid of this nasty third order susceptibility and really express the stimulated cross-section by the spontaneous cross-section. And what you learn from it is that basically um, the spontaneous cross-section and the stimulated cross-section is very much linked. Basically, the classical cross-sections, which we can look up in our x-ray book,
we have to divide by one divided by energy, right? Also one divided by the photon energy square, and that scales the cross sections. So that tells us that soft X-rays and optical regimes have sizable cross sections for nonlinear probes, which is good for soft X-rays. It also tells us that hard X-rays, because it's one divided by energy square, really go into the basement very rapidly. So to do nonlinear probes for hard X-rays is a tedious business, but maybe also good, and we'll think about that. We have shown that in a few experiments. Um, this is a nice paper where basically we show that these kind of experiments uh, do work. You can direct basically through stimulation the radiation in a directed beam. Uh, you can also, of course, um, so to say, go to a certain level of stimulation uh, from the driving field. Hold on, I have to get the right button. And this is actually to be seen in the light of a, a large effort of people. Nina Rohringer, she has done that in um, um, basically in, in gases, uh, 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 fantastically. Other people have done that uh, and called it saturable absorption. They said aluminum becomes transparent. All of a sudden the light goes through, it doesn't stop anymore. Uh, and other people have worked very hard on so-called sequential processes, and it's always the same. It's basically when the core hole lifetime and the pulse length becomes equal, or the pulse length becomes shorter than the core hole lifetime, and you have enough field, you start to drive and compete with the natural background field. Whereas if the core hole lifetime is short versus the pulse length, you start to do a lot of sequential steps. Because you do it once, then the excited state again, 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 right? So these are the parameters which drive this whole domain of nonlinear and multiphoton processes, which is a cool new feature. And cross sections with soft X-rays are high for fundamental reasons. So soft X-rays will get, in addition, a lot of beautiful nonlinear optics and, and, and physics going, which I think is unique to soft X-rays. Hard X-rays will have a much harder time. That also has a drawback. And that is the interesting thing which Andreas shared. Uh, we collaborate a little with Andreas and, and Joe on, on these things. We do more the inelastic, they do of course elastic, which we don't do. We only look at inelastic scattering. But we do these complementary these experiments. So what also can happen, of course, is that you just excite and go back down. We had the talk before, speckle, right? Only momentum transfer. What's interesting, of course, speckle can also be stimulated. Because if you get excited, nothing speaks about, uh, for down stimulation. So the issue with speckle is if you increase intensity more and more and more, you also start to increase the down pumping. And that means down pumping in speckle means that basically at low intensity you see beautiful magnetic scattering, which is basically the diversion of light, transfer momentum. If you start to stimulate the incoming beam excites, but it also pumps back down again. And pump back down again means that the incoming beam is, amplifies itself. So the light going forward straight is amplified by stimulation. And on the expense of momentum transfer, scattering. Is that clear? So all the intensity from the speckle pattern towards higher intensity is, is focused into the directed beam of the incoming uh, radiation because it's an elastic process. And that's actually what has been observed and there's a lot of debate between Stefan Eisebit and Scherz and all kinds of people, they look at it differently. That's only my private take. Um, I think it also tells us that the stimulating processes also play an important role in processes where you actually don't want them. The good thing is, in soft x-rays, that is the issue that you, you kind of kill the, the high Q by going in low Q in direct uh, transmission. But if you want to do single, because these are soft x-rays, that's why they have sizable cross-sections. But if you want to do single molecule diffraction with hard x-rays, that's of course good news because the cross-section with hard x-rays is very low. So there these competing channels maybe don't work so hard and you can still do it with very, very high intensities. Anyway, I come to the summary. Um, I was trying to just convey that it's worth, even today, to start a life with soft x-rays and maybe in particular today uh, because Soft X-rays are cool. Um, they are cool because they are unique in creating element-specific probes. They are unique in creating chemical state-selective probes, which is this chemical shift discussion. 
They are great to get out magnetic information, also nanoscale order that was in the last talk. You can all link this together. Then, because all the processes are actually scattering processes which happen on a femtosecond time scale, they are even cool probes to actually learn about dynamics on these very specific and selected centers. And you can do it in two ways. You could either say, because it's a rather fast femtosecond scattering process, I can probe everything which is slower, picoseconds, nanoseconds, a few hundred femtoseconds. And that is what is classical pump probe time resolved X-ray spectroscopy. But you can also say, wow, because the scattering takes time, and we can control it through the tuning and the scattering duration time and all these concepts, we can even learn about femtosecond and attosecond dynamics in comparing the intrinsic X-ray scattering duration to other dynamics, which is the so-called core hole clock approach. And finally, it also leads to this very interesting fact that because we now have enough photons during the scattering duration time, we can push it into the nonlinear domain and create completely new selectivities and probes, which are uniquely powerful in the soft X-ray range because that's where the cross-section is big. And with that, uh, I end and thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.